Well, good afternoon, everyone. So glad that you could be back out as we do this next series on the dangers of secular psychology. Let's start out with a brief word of prayer. If you, will you bow with me? Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to come before you. And as we continue this series, we pray and we plead for your Holy Spirit to give wisdom and strength to myself and that you may give understanding to those who are listening. We thank you for the, the truths of your word that counter, counteracts the counterfeit messages of the enemy. Bless us, keep us, and thank you for being able to bow before you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, thus far we've looked at some things about secular psychology that we need to be careful about. And I'm just going to briefly review our last session was talking about self-esteem and also the area of needs. And we talked about, again, the truth and the error in these different concepts. The idea that the world pushes and that secular psychology pushes is that we must feel good about ourselves. And Pastor Boyd mentioned another aspect of it this morning about this thing that we must love ourselves. And many of us as psychologists who are Christians would use that verse, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But as was explained so well by Pastor Bohr this morning, if we don't um, focus on loving others and loving Jesus first, and we focus on loving ourselves first, we will never get to the point where we'll love others outside of ourselves. Because we're naturally prone to love ourselves. We're naturally prone to want to raise our self-esteem. So we need to watch for that and look at the biblical principles that talks about humility, that talks about loving others more than ourselves um, and esteeming others more than ourselves. And then we also talked about the whole area of needs. Psychologists state, and it's true, we are born with certain needs that we have, social needs, emotional needs, psychological needs. But what has happened is that as a church, we've spent so much time looking at the felt needs, the needs that we really um, don't have to have as fulfilled as much as we think they should be fulfilled, and we've neglected pointing people to Jesus, pointing people to God, pointing people to the truth. And so this afternoon, we want to look at another particular area. Now, this area is a little more controversial because sometimes people, I found that um, when we look at this area of unconditional acceptance, unconditional love, I get a lot of resistance from people because um, it is true that God doesn't have conditions on, for us per se, in order to accept us, in order to love us, but it is also true that there are limits to that. And we'll see about this as, as we go on. When we think of the word unconditional, unconditional refers to without conditions or reservations, absolute. So when we think about unconditional acceptance, this is acceptance without any conditions or without any reservations or kind of an absolute acceptance. The idea is that people need to be accepted and loved unconditionally without any conditions of performance. That's what, when psychologists have put that forward, that's what is meant by that. Loving people and accepting people without any conditions of, of appearance, of, of, I'm sorry, without any conditions of performance. Now remember, truth and error. Is there not some truth to that? We kind of want people to accept us without certain conditions before we, they ex we, uh, we are accepted by people or loved. But the problem is that Satan kind of carries this to the extreme and it gets into an area where we don't recognize that God does have certain things he requires of us. And that's what happens with these concepts. Remember, truth mixed with error. The roots of this thinking is very dangerous. So let me tell you about the roots. Have you heard of humanistic psychology? All of these things that I've been speaking about comes mostly from humanistic psychology. And humanistic psychologists believe that people are born good. Thus, if they are loved and accepted unconditionally, they will naturally blossom into their best self. You all see the root of that? We're born good, and because we're born good, if conditions are taken away or if we don't have to fulfill any conditions, we'll just naturally develop into the people we, that we should be. And when conditions are placed on them, this doesn't happen. This is according to humanistic psychology. Now, this thinking has kind of come into the church, and I want to give an example of this. The minimal guarantee we must make to people is that they will be loved always, 
under every circumstance with no exception. The second guarantee is that they will be totally accepted without any reservation. Now on the surface, that sounds good, doesn't it? But if you're thinking, if you have your thinking caps on, you can see how Satan can take this and carry this too far, can you not? And he has done so. And I want you to, to start to think about that. It rings with some truth, but it's led to some dangerous beliefs and practices. For example, this belief can encourage us to believe that when people come into the church, there are certain things we should not share with them because we want to accept them unconditionally. Are you all following me? Don't say too much to them about this aspect or that aspect because we want them to feel loved and accepted. And if we share with them these different things, then they might run away and they might not want to be part of our church. And thus this thinking has led to the birth of many churches now, even Seventh-day Adventist churches, baptizing people bringing them into our fold and not teaching them certain truths. Are you all following me? That's the danger of this unconditional idea. Satan takes it and he carries it too far. And that's what we have to think about. Earlier I mentioned the contemporary Christian music movement. That is associated with this idea of unconditional acceptance. By the way, I didn't say much about this author who wrote the book that I have had up, and I'm going to put the quote up in a, in a little bit. But he was a person who was all into the contemporary Christian music movement. He was a worship leader, and he wrote this book after he left the contemporary Christian music movement. And it's a book I admonish you to get. It's called Why I Left the Contemporary um, Christian Movement. And it talks about it. And in there, he talks about some aspects of psychology that is embraced by this contemporary Christian music movement. And let me give you this quote when he talks about acceptance. That's just a picture of people with that type of worship style. Unconditional acceptance doctrine is so pervasive to some fellowships, he says, that Christians are no longer allowed to question another Christian's behavior or personal preferences. If you confront another in love, you will be accused of judging them. Have you all heard that? If you dare quote chapter and verse from the Bible, you will be called a Pharisee. If a church has practices that step on the toes of anyone's personal preferences, then it is considered to be what kind of church? A legalistic church. And this author recognizes that the foundation for this is this thinking of unconditional acceptance. I don't want to give the enemy too much credit, but he is very crafty because there is some truth to this. As I started out, we don't have to do certain things in order to deserve God's love. We don't have to do certain things in order to deserve God's acceptance. But what happens is with that, we take it and we carry it to a place that it doesn't need to go, such as what I just read. Do you all follow me? Is it making sense what I'm saying? And so we have to be careful with these concepts as we allow them to come into the church and we allow them to affect us in a way. It's a real slippery slope. Now let's look at this whole perspective that I started out with by saying that humanistic psychologists state that we are born good and we develop problems because of the conditions that others place on us. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.12 what? There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Humanistic psychologists despise this kind of principle. They really do. And as I mentioned earlier, they look at it almost as a sort of um, promotion of self-hatred. Nothing good in, in us. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Those ideas are despised and opposed by humanistic psychologists. But the truth is, that is who we are. There's nothing that we could do that's good. Even when the person came to Jesus and said, good master, what did he say to the person? Why callest thou me good? There is none good but the Father. Isn't that what he said? But yet we are uh, uh, imbibing these beliefs that we are born good and thus we go on with the unconditional acceptance and unconditional love, etc. Because of sin, 
We naturally move away from what is good. Our minds don't naturally move towards what is good, in spite of what the humanistic psychologists are telling us. Another verse, the carnal or natural mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So this contradicts the idea that we are born good and that if no conditions are placed on us, we will just naturally develop into good people. That's not true, because the Bible tells us that naturally our minds are against God. Satan wants us to think that there's something inherently good in us. He himself knows this is not true, but he can accomplish a lot towards his goal of turning us away from acknowledging God, which can in turn affect how we view ourselves and how we view God. Now, let me share this quote from the servant of the Lord found in Messages to Young People. If Satan can so befog and deceive the human mind and lead mortals to think there is an inherent power in themselves to accomplish great and good works, what happens? They cease to rely upon God to do that for them which they think exists in themselves to do. This is what happens with humanistic psychology. If Satan can make us think that we have good in ourselves and that if people will just leave us and, con and, and accept us unconditionally, if Satan can lead us to do that, then we don't realize our need for God. They acknowledge not a superior power. They give not God the glory he claims, which is due to his great and excellent majesty. So this quote is letting us know what happens when we believe this deceptive belief that we are naturally good and that there's something within us that we can naturally do to accomplish good. In addition, the truth is, in addition to this, there's the truth that there will come a point where God will no longer accept us if we choose to stay in our sins, ignore his commands, and the directions for our lives as people. Even though God doesn't want us to have conditions before he accepts us or loves us, God has limits, brothers and sisters. And we see that in the Garden of Eden. If God was a man or a being who naturally or unconditionally accepted Adam and Eve, he would have just given them a little pat on the wrist and say, no problem that you took the fruit from the knowledge of tree and evil, of good and evil. I accept you unconditionally. You can stay right in this garden. You know? Really, if you carry that, that's basically what he would have done. But that's not what happens because God has limits. And if we choose to continue to rebel and to go against him, those limits will be shown. This is an example in Jeremiah 14.10. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, thus they have loved, they ha they have, have they loved to wander, they have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord, what? Doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. If God was truly unconditionally accepting us as brought about or by taught by humanistic psychologists, he would not say through the prophet Jeremiah that after they've loved to wander, have not refrained their feet, the Lord does not accept them. There is a limit to what God will do. Um, Let's be careful not to presume upon his love. The Sermon of the Lord has another quote, I don't have it up there, that talks about this goody-goody religion that causes the sinner to always focus on the love of God. And what she's saying in that is sometimes we focus on the love of God and we forget that there are requirements that God has for us. I think it's important to focus on the love of God. Please don't get me wrong. I think many people need to focus more on the love of God. But sometimes when we push the, the wrong aspects of the love of God, we leave people to think that there's nothing that they need to do. There's no changes they need to make, and God loves them just as they are, and everything is peachy keen. And there's a danger with that. There really is a danger with that. And God, Satan wants us to accept this false philosophy. Do you see, though, how it can be easy to accept this because there's some truth and error mixing in there? It's real easy to accept it, and it's only by the distinguishing power of the Holy Spirit can we see the difference between the unconditional love and acceptance that God has versus what Satan is pushing through psychology. Is this clear for you all? Does it make sense what I'm saying? I hope so. Now let's move on to another aspect of psychology, the whole area of emotions. You know, when I was trained as a psychologist, in the realm of psychology, we were taught that emotions are primary. 
I was taught when people come in to me that one of the main things I should do is to help them get in touch with their feelings. I was supposed to do that, you know? And I, I, I talked to a sister here who has a wonderful testimony. I don't know if we'll have time. To, I would love her to share some of it if possible. When she went to a counselor and, and the counselor tried to get her going down that road, but because she knew the word of God, she was able to steer the direction of the counseling away from that. And that's why it's so, it's so important to know God's word. But I was taught that you have to tap into people's feelings and emotions. And I would have people draw their emotions. And I would have people write about their emotions. And I would have people do all kinds of exercises to get in touch with their emotions. Because that's the part of them that was repressed. And that's why they're suffering. Because they can't get, they, they, they don't have that repressed part coming out. And someone said to me, they didn't know I was Seventh-day Adventist when I was doing this. But brothers and sisters, there are a host of Seventh-day Adventist therapists who are using these methods. I was Seventh-day Adventist, born into the, the, into the truth, if you can really be born into the truth. But I was born into a home that has had a Seventh-day Adventist parent. One of my parents was Seventh-day Adventist, the other one was not. And I was following these methods, not recognizing that they were violating principles in the Bible. And I really had the idea that I was going to come out and help the Adventist church by taking my secular psychology and bringing it in and helping people. And that's what many people believe. They're sincere. These folks are not trying to hurt people. Because we've lost power as a church, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, it's because of the lack of power we have at a church that we're grabbing at these different philosophies. Do you realize that? People need help, and we're grabbing at these. Now, the emotions are not primary for God. Emotions are secondary, but they are important, and the Bible shows us that. For example, in Proverbs 17, 22, the Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like what? And, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. This is talking about emotions. You can be sad, discouraged, and depressed, and that actually can have a physiological effect on you. But being happy can actually have a, a positive physiological effect on you. So emotions are significant. I don't want you to walk away from here thinking that it's not significant. But the difference is, for God, they're not the primary thing. We're not to focus on emotions in order to get better. And one of the emotions that we focus a lot in psychology is anger. Anger is focused a lot in psychology. And what I would often do when people came from backgrounds where they were traumatized, where they were abused, I would try to get them to get in touch with their anger. I would do various things to get in touch with that anger. And I would find whatever is going on in their life to try to tap into what I felt they were angry about. Real dangerous. Anger is something that's there, and I would counsel people who were abused, encouraging, encouraging them to feel their anger and helping them learn how to express anger towards whoever hurt them. And many therapists are taught to do this. In fact, this was a book that I used. This quote that I'm going to show is a book that I used to help sexual abuse victims. Oh, this is another verse on, on um, emotions that I, did, I failed to mention. But this particular book was called The Courage to Heal. And in that book, this is what the author said for people who were molested. You may dream of murder or castration, referring to the perpetrator. It can be pleasurable to fantasize such scenes in detail. Let yourself imagine it to your heart's content. And I did that, my brothers and my sisters. When people were molested, I said, imagine whatever you want to against this person who has hurt you, who has violated you, because this person deserves it, and you're suffering because of what has happened. And these are the kind of things that's happening in many therapy sessions when people go there and they've been hurt. You're saying, oh, because you're more of an astute kind of audience, but many Seventh-day Adventist Christians have bought into this kind of thinking. It's sad. But it's true. And this is what we used to do with, with people who, I used to do with people who were molested and abused. Um, listen to this quote right here. The next time you have a negative emotion, take care not to resist or fight it. Don't immediately attach to it the idea that is proof you stepped outside of the light of God. Instead, Think of it as a means by which you can move closer to God because that's exactly what it is. 
a Christian person wrote that when you have a negative emotion, kind of stay with that. Dwell on it. Focus on it. Because it, it might help you move, move closer to God. And if I was one of those who believed in that kind of thinking, if you're not grounded in the Bible, I could actually stand up here and make you believe that. Because Satan's devices are that tricky. It's only by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures that you can discern what is false about these types of things. And many Christians grab onto this. What does the Bible say about what we need to do with angry emotions? Let's look at what the Bible says. In Colossians 3.8, the Bible says through the Apostle Paul, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. What are we supposed to do with anger? Put it off. Now, is it easily done as I'm saying? No. If you've been greatly hurt, only the Holy Spirit can give you the power to put off that anger. But the imperative and the command is still there. Here's another quote about anger. But let all, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is the Holy Scripture's admonition on what to do with anger. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that I used to use as a Christian psychologist to support being angry. You might know what that verse is. It's in Ephesians 4.32 where it says what? Be ye angry and do not, do what? I actually had Christians coming into my office and saying, but Dr. Park, should we be feeling angry? Of course we should be feeling angry. The Bible says be ye angry and sin not. As long as you're angry and you don't sin, you're fine. Isn't that what that verse means? However, I did more study on that verse as the Holy Spirit started to, to work with me and I found out that the only type of anger that's justifiable is righteous self-indignation. That is the only anger that's justifiable in God's sight. Now, it doesn't mean you won't feel the anger, but when things happen and that anger comes, you have to allow God to help you handle that anger in the way that's pleasing to him. This is what the servant of the Lord says about it. It is true that there is an indignation that is justifiable, even in the followers of Christ. When they see that God is dishonored and his service brought into disrepute, when they see the innocent oppressed, a righteous indignation stirs the soul. Such anger born of sensitive morals is not a sin. So when we see God being dishonored, when we see innocent people being hurt, that kind of anger is acceptable in God's sight. Do you remember, you remember Jesus going into the temple and throwing the uh, tables over and the money changers chasing them out, that was, a, that was a form of anger. Not once did we see in the Bible showing that kind of anger when Jesus was mistreated. Did you ever see him getting angry like that when people mistreated him? Now, you know, in your mind, on a human level, you think to yourself, that's impossible. I'm going to be angry if someone mistreats me, if someone violates me. That is what the natural person will do. But my challenge to you is to move beyond what's natural and ask the Holy Spirit to give you that, that response to anger that only he can give. But I want you to not go along with this idea that we have to learn how to express our emotions in order to get better because that is different than what God tells us to do. That's what I'm hoping you're getting from this. In fact, in Matthew 5, 22, when Jesus was doing, giving his sermon on the mount, he says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. There's some reasons we might be angry at our brother, it's true, but we have to make sure that it is the anger that is accepted by God and not, is the, not the anger that we're encouraged to have from a secular um, psychology perspective. And again, this takes supernatural power. Speaking of self-centered anger, the um, problem with dealing with negative emotions is that most of the times we deal with it from a self-centered perspective. And some may ask, how do I deal with people who mistreat me or take advantage of me? Again, I repeat, it takes supernatural power. And this goes against the grain of most of what we have been taught, but there's hope. I remember working with a woman whose son was gunned down in Atlanta. 
She came into me, came to me. At that time, I hadn't changed my perspective. I was starting to change my perspective of how I work to people. She came to me, and every week, it was like this, this, her son had just been murdered, and it had happened a few months before she came to me. But the anger was so fresh within her that every time I spoke to her, I felt like I was talking to the same woman, exploring the same things. So after a few months, the Holy Spirit says, you have to move this woman away from this. And I said to her, Mrs. Such and Such, do you think that you can ever, by God's grace, forgive this person who has killed your son? And she looked at me and she reared up her eyes. If they could have popped out of their, uh, her head, they would have. Never will I forgive that person. I have lost my son and I will never forgive that person. Do you think that lady will ever achieve healing, my brothers and sisters? And it's easy for me to say that because I don't have a son who's been gunned down. I don't want to sound like I'm insensitive. But the bottom line is, unless she gets to the point, I don't know how she's doing this was years ago, where she is, but my prayer is that for her own sanity, her own peace, that she will get to the point where she can ask God to help her forgive. You've heard of stories. I remember hearing of the stories with the Tutsis and the, um, uh, what were those two groups in Africa? I forgot. Hutsis and Tutsis, right? And rem um, and what had happened was one of these women, I remember reading this story somewhere, I think I saw it on one of these programs where the, the person who had gunned down her husband, she actually took him in as a, and adopted him as a son. That person's healing, I'm sure, was much more um, advanced than those who were not able to forgive those who killed their, their family members. And again, I don't want to sound insensitive. It takes supernatural power. But if we're working with people who are hurt, this forgiveness element has to come in in order for us to be able to help people to move um, from there. Now, you know there's evidence from the secular psychology world. Um, I think I have another quote that I wanted to mention. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. This is a verse. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. I had to put that up to show another example of what this, this hatred, this anger will do. But what I was starting to say is there's also research from the secular psychological field that shows that this thing about releasing and expressing ang anger is not the best thing. Look at what this particular psychologist says. Most research now says that catharsis, which means letting anger out, isn't helpful and may actually increase a person's hostility. I remember the, in the days when, you've heard of these, I would have pillows in my office and people would be angry and I'd say, punch that pillow to get your anger out. Remember? Research now shows that that actually makes your anger worse. But there are psychologists and therapists who are still having people punch the pillows. And that's what I'm talking about when I said earlier, there's a divide between what science is showing and what some therapists are still doing in their office. Punching pillows does not help a person with anger. And in fact, we shouldn't really even be spending a lot of time talking about feelings in therapy. And the servant of the Lord says this well in this quote, it is not the petty feelings and emotions that are to be examined. We are to look away from self to who? So we spend too much time talking about emotions, which, which makes us more self-focused, which is the problem I have with a lot of these psychological practices. We get more self-focused, and we can go no higher than self and human beings. We have to move away from that. And studying emotions will not help us move away from that. Now, another emotion that I want to spend some time talking about, there are many emotions, but I just um, chose two that I wanted to focus on for purposes of this presentation, is guilt. You know, guilt is wreaking the lives of many people. The sad part is that um, guilt can be destructive, but many psychologists believe guilt is something you should completely stay away from. People should not be led to feel guilty. This is one example of one psychologist. And she says, guilt is the worst experience known to humans. It makes you feel unworthy and miserable. It is caused by thinking you have done something wrong. You are taught to feel guilt when someone judges you about anything. And she goes on to say, there is no right or wrong, only experiences to learn from. So get out there and enjoy learning and living and growing. Toss guilt out. You think we should toss guilt out? 
we should not toss guilt out. There are some aspects of guilt we should toss out, toss out but we shouldn't toss get out, guilt out completely, and this will make more sense as we move forward. Albert Ellis is a father of, some of you have heard of cognitive behavior therapy. Now he's kind of the father of cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive therapy, and he has some good things he says, but this is one that I don't agree with. Well, I don't agree with fully. There's some truth and there's some error. He says, the more sinful and guilty a person feels, the less chance there is he will be a happy, healthy, or law-abiding citizen. He will become a compulsive wrongdoer. Remember, truth and error. There's some truth with that. People who are always made to feel guilty won't be very happy. But the more sinful you feel in the reality sense or in the way of scripture about how God looks at things, the more scripture you, the sinful you feel, the more that should turn you to God. But Albert Ellis doesn't recognize this. He just looks at the negative side of this. And this thinking has come into our church. This is an old quote, over 20 years old, but I still thought it was significant. This Christian says, a Christian writer says, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude uncouth and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Uncouth, crude, unchristian. And I put this under the category of guilt because when people feel their lost and sinful condition, they're gonna feel guilt, amen? But because we've taken this idea that it's not good for people to feel guilt, we've let it come into Christianity, and this makes us shy away from showing people their lost and sinful condition. And then the sad part for me is that it has taken the pulpit of our churches. Listen to what I mean by this. There has been a strong tendency for the preacher to move into the field of pastoral counseling. Basic to mo most techniques of counseling is an avoidance of any response which might impute wrong or moral judgment upon the individual being counseled. In other words, one of the basics of counseling techniques is what I said earlier, unconditional acceptance. To make sure that the person that you're talking to doesn't feel wrong about what they've done or you're not passing any moral judgment on them. And preachers are taking on that same kind of thinking in their preaching. This attitude has frequently been translated into the pulpit presentation of the preacher. No longer are right and wrong clearly defined, and congregations are left to their uncertainty and sin. But we go on to say true repentance is only recognized when wrong, is only realized when wrong is recognized. You know, we're having more sermons that kind of feel good touchy-feely, making sure people's emotions are being tapped into, and preachers are moving away from pointing out sin. And you know that what I think that's having a boomerang effect in our congregation, I really do. I, would, I bet you if I were to do a scientific survey, those kind of um, congregations where they're getting those messages constantly probably have a higher percentage of people who are struggling with sin than those who are not doing that. I think all congregations have people struggling with sin, but when you get into this pastoral counseling in the pulpit, pastoral counseling should be when you come to me and you're asking me for help. But in the pulpit, we need to be letting people see where they are and their need for Christ. Y'all following what I'm saying? And, and that's what's happening with this whole focus on staying away for guilt, from guilt. Look at what the servant of the Lord says. There are many, very many in the churches who are deceiving their own souls. They reach a standard of their own creating. They think that religion consists of going to church to hear sermons and to have a good, happy feeling. This fair-weathered Christianity will not do in the time toward which we are rushing. Under the sun of scorching trial, all such will be found withered away. So the idea of going to church to feel good, to make sure we don't feel guilt, it's going to catch up with us when trial comes. That's what she's saying here. It's going to catch up, and we're going to um, actually be withering away when the trial comes. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, we're told, For godly sorrow 
worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's two characters in the Bible that really shows that this verse is true. Do you know who those two characters are? Anybody? Peter and Judas. Peter had that godly sorrow which worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But Judas had the sorrow of the world that worketh death. And that's what happens when guilt is not approached in the way that it should. In Steps to Christ, we read about guilt, about Judas. The confession was forced from his guilty soul by an awful sense of condemnation. The consequences filled him with terror, but there was no deep, heartbreaking grief in his soul that he had betrayed the spotless Son of God. He lamented the results of his sin, but did not sorrow for the sin itself. And it actually ended up leading to him killing himself. In psychology, most of the time we think people kill themselves because they've been so thoroughly depressed. I believe there are many people killing themselves under the load of guilt. They don't know where else to turn. They get to a point of helplessness because of the things they've done in their lives, and they don't understand about true confession and true repentance. Guilt is a problem in our church. Let's talk about the other side of guilt. There is um, many of us, there are many people suffering from anxiety, from depression, from various psychological ills because they've not properly dealt with their guilt. And so the idea that I'm promoting here is not for us to go around making people feeling guilty. It's about making people um, experience guilt to understand their loss or understanding their lost condition to lead them to, to guilt and then turn to the Savior. But many of us are suffering from what I call and others call false guilt. You know how you're suffering from false guilt? There are different ways. One way to know if you're suffering from false guilt. If you've repented of a sin, you know that you've gone to Jesus and you've repented and asked him forgiveness and you continue to feel guilt about that, where do you think that guilt is coming from? Satan. Satan. Romans 8, 1 tells us, therefore there is not now no condemnation for those who walk after Christ Jesus or in, in the spirit, you know? And Satan will come at you, beating you down, condemning you for something that you have definitely confessed to God. Then there's some of us feeling guilt for things that we really shouldn't feel guilty about. Some of us have grown up in homes where we were modeled, ha parents modeled for us that you should feel guilt about every little thing. And we have what's known as a falsely trained conscience. And the enemy uses that conscience to beat us down. We could also have a falsely trained conscience by the fact that we've lived a life where we've done so many things and we've not actually dealt with that before the Lord. And so times we, sometimes we feel this false sense of guilt for things we shouldn't feel guilty for and the things we should feel guilty for, we don't address. I've met many people suffering under guilt as I've, since I've been in this Seventh-day Adventist church, since I've, I'm working with Christians. Many people are suffering with guilt. You go to the psychiatric hospitals, many people are there suffering with guilt. And it's amazing what guilt can, can do. This side story, I, I had some friends, a couple, and the husband started to see things and hear voices. And the wife tried to ask him, what's going on? Why are you hearing voices and seeing things? It just came up all out of the blue, started happening he confessed to her that he had had two affairs on her. After he confessed the affairs, guess what happened to the voices and the things he was seeing? They went away, which lets me see how powerful guilt can be when we don't confess things. Confession is very important, and the enemy wants to prevent us from confessing, and I think he wants to prevent us from hearing about our sinful condition, and then we don't confess, and then we don't get true healing. You see what he does? It's a domino effect. But guilt is something that we have to deal with. Guilt also is very prominent in addiction. I do believe in some aspects of addiction. And there is one particular addiction model that I think is so true. Addicts go through a model of they feel shame and guilt, then they indulge in the behavior, then they, feel they go through a period of penance where they do whatever they can to pay for that particular behavior that they've engaged in. And in this case, guilt becomes addictive. 
Because what happens, instead of you looking for true change, the guilt leads them to do penance, and penance can be different things for different people. I heard of one person who had a sexual sin, and that person would go away for long periods of time when he would engage in a sexual sin and just fast and afflict himself before the Lord. But guess what? When he came back, he engaged in the sin again. Guilt became counterproductive there. It didn't turn him to the Savior and turn him to the cross and help him understand the power of salvation to the gospel. It just kept him in that addictive cycle. And in that case, guilt is not very productive. Are you all following what I mean? Guilt, if it doesn't turn us to the Savior, can just keep us in that cycle. I used to work in an agency with sexual perpetrators, sexual offenders, and I mentioned this in a lot of my presentations because it's, I, I believe it's so true. And at that time, I bought into the belief that secular psychologists say that these people cannot be cured. And it's true, with their methods, they cannot be cured. But what I, towards the ending of my time in working with them, I said to one person who was a Christian, I said, you know, the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, burden that person told me that that took a burden off of his shoulders. I don't know what happened to him because that was my last time talking to him. But my prayer is that, that he really went to the Lord with his problem of being attracted to younger children and molesting them. That he, could, he recognized that he could get out of that shame-guilt cycle. You know, so this thing about guilt is good when it turns us to the Savior, but it is not good when it just keeps us in our behavior. And that can be applied not only to sexual addictions, but other addictions. It can be applied to problem behaviors we have in our own life. If guilt does not point, point you to the Savior and just causes you to feel down and bad all the time, that is not a guilt that's coming from the Lord. I want you to recognize that. And there are two Psalms that's very powerful for this, Psalms 32 and Psalms 51. These are the two Psalms that David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba was discovered. I remember talking to a lady, she came to me after a seminar I did, and she said, I have been dealing with these guilt about things that I've done to my children, I don't know how to get past it. And I didn't really have time to do counseling with her, but I just said to her, you know what, I want you to go home and I want you to read Psalm 32. And in the place of, of the pronouns and where David may say I, etc., I want you to put your name in there. She did that. And usually this doesn't happen this quickly, but the next day she came back and her face looked completely different, brothers and sisters. She said, I read that chapter, I put my name in the place of it, and God, I believe, has taken this guilt away from me. Now, I'm not saying that this will happen to everyone so quickly. I'm not trying to give the Bible as some kind of magic pill. You take it and overnight you're changed. But what I do believe is God's principles work. It may not happen that quickly, but if you're dealing with guilt, Psalms 32, Psalms 51 are some powerful psalms that can help you move past that guilt. And I want to encourage you to do that. Now, before we finish up, I do want to start with the whole area of moving away from the dangers of secular psychology. We're going to elaborate that in, on that in our next presentation, but we have some minutes left, and I wanted to start that out here. When we talk about psychology and moving away from it, one of the first steps that we need to take is to recognize that we have to test everything by the word of God. What did I say? We have to test what? Everything by the word of God. And we're told this in this particular verse. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. If I had tested everything that I learned in psychology by God's word, many things I would have thrown away a long time ago. But I didn't recognize that I had to do this because I bought everything that I learned hook, line, and sinker, as they say. But praise God, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. I just praise his name for that. It meant me leaving a practice. It meant me making, in my ministry, I probably make one-fourth of what I made in practice, okay? But my conscience is so much more clear. You know, and again, I said earlier, I don't think it's wrong to be in private practice. Lord, the Lord may be leading me back there, but I tell you, I will be doing it a whole different way than what I did before, which will also probably mean less money, but I really feel as though I'll be helping people towards true healing. Ellen G. White tells us, a servant of the Lord, the word of God is the great detector of what? Error. To wit, we believe everything must be brought. We must study it how? 
reverentially. We must go before God with a sense of reverence when we study his word. We are to receive no one's opinions without comparing it with scripture. Not Freud's opinions, not Roger's opinions, and I say opinions boldly because these theories have not been tested by science. They're merely opi opinions. In psychology, we call them theories, but in reality, they're opinions. And they have to be tested by scripture. Now, you know, there are some aspects of psychology that has been supported or goes right along with scripture. And I want to share some of these with you right now. Let's look at some of this. This says, people who provide no support to others are more than twice as likely to die in a five-year period as people who helped spouses, friends, relatives, and neighbors. Giving to a spouse, a friend, and a neighbor is linked with a lower chance of dying. Isn't that amazing? If you're selfish, you're gonna die earlier. Did you know that? <laughs> You're going to die earlier. It actually will have a physiological and mental and spiritual impact on you. And the Bible told us this long ago about the true fast. Is it not to deal thy bread to, hung to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thy cover him, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. When we engage in the true fast, it has an impact on our health. And we see there that science is going along or supporting what God says. I have a radio program that I do in Atlanta, and I, it's mostly non-Adventists listening to this, non-Christians in some cases. And I love to bring out the science when I'm talking about different things because people respond to that. You know, mm, yeah, I'll say this. I, I remember talking to a, a head of a particular lifestyle center, and sad to say this happened. The person said that a couple came to him and said, you know what? We're going to take science and present the health message to non-Seventh-day Adventists, and we're going to use spirit of prophecy to present the health message seven day, to Seventh-day Adventists. A few little while later, they came to him and said, you know what? We had to switch that around. We had to use science for Seventh-day Adventists to present the health message, and we used spirit of prophecy for non-Seventh-day Adventists. It's kind of sad that in our church we've gotten to the point that we won't believe it until, unless science says it. And the servant of the Lord has says this, said these things over 150 plus years ago. It is what it, what it is. So when I'm going to Seventh-day Adventist churches, I have to throw in that science. I like science anyway. I used to teach research when I was teaching at Oakwood College. So I like science. But I also do it because I know there are naysayers out there that if I just put up spirit of, spirit of prophecy quotes, you know, there may be some skepticism there. So, but science and spirit of prophecy and science of the Bible, I don't even know why I got into saying that. Um, but I was thinking about science and the impact that it has. Let's look at another study. 16,475 American college um, I should say students, surveyed between 1979 and 2006. One out of the four students in recent generations showed, an ele showed elevated rates of narcissism. In 1985, that number was only one in seven. Narcissism is this, this idea, this self-focused kind of idea carried to the extreme. And what research is showing is that as time goes on, people are getting more self-absorbed. Too much self-absorption can also often lead to interpersonal strife. Psychologists are realizing that if you're too absorbed in self, it can cause problems. Even though most of the theories and things that they do are self-absorbed, but the idea is they're realizing that it can cause problems. The Bible said this long ago about what would happen. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. As we see people becoming more and more self-absorbed, we're knowing that we are definitely reaching the end of time. It's amazing now to see how self-absorbed people are when they're driving, when they're in the stores. People are so into themselves. Sometimes they don't realize what's around them, and that's the ploy of the enemy. Uh, I, this is not a scripture, but this is from Spirit of Prophecy. She says, selfishness is the want, which means the lack of Christ-like humility, and its existence is the bane, which means curse or blight, of human happiness. 
So she said this way before psychologists says too much self-absorption can lead to interpersonal strife. And we're going to talk a little bit more about science and spirit of prophecy. There's a lot of things being shown about what she has told us years ago that um, science is confirming. Another study. Do you all mind me going through these studies and showing how they fit with the Bible? I hope not. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Subjects completed a survey that measured happiness, gratitude, and thankfulness. Then they were told to write down five things they were grateful for. The researchers found that participants who counted their blessings once a week expressed more gratitude and thankfulness and rated themselves significantly higher than before. Happier, thank you, than before. <laughs> so the idea is when you count your blessings, it increases your sense of happiness. And didn't the Bible tell us that in various ways? Well, the Bible tells us. It doesn't tell us why. But Philippians 4.4 4 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? And in then he also says in Proverbs, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. You see, what happens is that the Bible has these principles that we can use to help people. But we don't, we don't study the Bible to gain from it practically. You know, we have this read the Bible through one year, and I think that's a wonderful idea. My problem with, with just reading the Bible through one year, in one year, is that we don't pull out the principles from there. And when I say to people, I teach a class sometimes at one of our lifestyle centers, and sometimes I'll pull out information, and they will say, uh, I said, these are some things that can help with guilt or with anger, and some of the students will say, these are just Bible verses. You know, and it's sad, but that's how we think. When, I come, when people come to me and I say, well, let's see what the Bible says. How is the Bible going to help me with this? I need some practical help. I remember talking to a mother who was dealing with some issues with her children. This is not the Bible, but these are inspired writings. And I said, why don't you, let's, let's look at what child guidance. She says, oh, I've read through child guidance. That can't help me with this situation. You know, we don't sense that there are practical things that we can pull out of these books, and we don't read them in a way that we can pull out practical things, and thus we run to secular psychology. Because psychology might tell you, okay, with your husband, you need to listen to them, and you'll need to communicate well, and you need to do these five things. And all of that is important, but as um, my cousins, I have some cousins who do marriage and family um, uh, seminars, and they have re revamped how they do the seminars. They said to me, Magna, if we can't start on the level of people being converted, it doesn't help to give them the five ways to do such and such and such and such. We have to start with conversion. After people are conversion, converted, then we can give them these practical steps. And I'm saying all of that to say the Bible has different things and has, has practical information that we can use to help one another and to help ourselves. We just have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be able to do this. And I'm talking about moving away from psychology because I want to help you understand that the Bible has some powerful information and science is starting to support that the Bible has this information. Increases in forgiveness have been found to be related to what? More satisfaction with life, more positive mood, less negative mood, and fewer physical symptoms. The Bible has been telling us, and when you stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any. God didn't just come up with these principles just to give us something to do. God was the one who created us. He understands how the mind works. He understands what is important for healing. And so the principles that he gives us is the ones that's going to help us move towards healing. Amen? And so forgiveness is something, you hear me talking a lot about forgiveness because I, I think it's so important and actually, believe it or not, when you pick up the psychological literature, they're actually starting to talk about forgiveness too. They might not say that God should forgive, but they talk about that clients should learn how to forgive. They can't run away. Psychologists can no longer run away from these spiritual principles. I remember going through graduate school, they would say to me, if you keep up with this Christian, even though I didn't understand what I understand now, they told me, if you keep up with this Christian perspective, you're not going to be a good counselor. I was told that by several of my teachers because, you know, this Christian perspective is restricting you. It's not allowing you to really get in and do some of these methods, even though I was doing most of what they were teaching me, but there were some things I refused to do. Some people I refused to say I would help, like I refused to, to counsel people who were homosexuals if they didn't want to get away from that lifestyle. And I was really castigated in graduate school for that. You cannot be a good counselor if you're not willing to do that. But I believe now even more that when we take these principles, we can actually help people better. 
than just sticking with the secular psychological principles. So these are just studies that I wanted to share with you that you can look at and see that the Bible, we don't need this to see that the Bible is helpful, but some of us are skeptics and we want to see what science says about the Bible. And so I, I put these up there and I'm going to talk about a few more studies. So today in this presentation, I hope you understand some of the things. I'm going to just recap because we have a few minutes. Understanding that emotions are important. God spoke about them in the Bible, but they're not things that we should be focusing on primarily. They're, they're secondary things, and with the negative emotions, we need to ask God to help us, to give us the supernatural power to move away from some of these negative emotions and to allow God to use the emotions in the way that he wants, such as guilt and such as the, the right type of anger. And I also talked a little bit about, a lot about unconditional acceptance and unconditional love, how this whole thinking can move us away from really recognizing that God has conditions and God has limits to what he's doing. Um, my prayer is that these things that I've presented, I just hope that you will go home and study these out if you have questions, and even if you don't. And if you know people who are being um, imbibed and, and deceived by these different psychological theories, my prayer is that you be able to take something out of this. I think there's going to be a, I don't think, there is going to be a DVD series, DVD series from this that Secrets Unsealed will have. I also have the book on Christians Beware the Dangers of, of Secular Psychology. Um, Secrets Unsealed always also has that. And then I want to encourage you to go to my website, too, and we'll talk a little bit about that off the air. You could um, go and get some other resources that I have. I pray that what has been presented has been a blessing. That's always my prayer. And I pray that God will help you as you move towards following his principles for healing and for growing. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Father, thank you again for the privilege of being able to share with your people. And we pray that we may continue to recognize that your way is the best. We thank you for what you've given to us, and we thank you that you love us so much to help us to detect truth from error. Bless us, guide us, and keep us. In the name of Jesus, your son, we do pray. Amen.